team members of the Baltimore County Police Department. I'm Major Michael Cortez III, and I'm honored to welcome you to this historic day as we commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Baltimore County Police Department. At this time, please rise for the posting of the colors by the Baltimore County Police Ceremonial Honor Guard Unit and the singing of the National Anthem and Pledge of Allegiance by Officer Timothy Thulian. Please remain standing for the invocation by Baltimore County Police Chaplain Bishop Reginald L. Kennedy. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets reglaying the bombs bursting Gave through through the night that our flag was still there. Who oh, said a last star spangled banner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the land of the free. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order. Oh. Ready. Face. Color. Forward. May we bow our heads in prayer. Wonderful and eternal, loving and kind God, our Heavenly Father, we bow before you on this beautiful moment of history. We thank you, O oh God, for the blessings and the favor of this day. We thank you that in April, April the 11th, 1874, you established and covered this department as they began that journey of protecting and serving the people of Baltimore County. We thank you, Father, for your love and your kindness, your strength. We pause, Father, to thank you for every brave man and woman who day after day uh, face their fears head on by serving this great community. We pause in our hearts to remember those brave men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice down through the year. We remember their service today. So we ask you, as we gather, that you would fill this place with the joy of this moment, that this will be more than a ceremony, but a time of reflection and joy, realizing if it wasn't for your guarding of us, we would not be here today. We thank you for life and livelihood. And we ask even now that you would protect this department as they go forward, that these brave men and women continue to serve you and this community in a special way. 
we thank you. We pray this prayer and the one who is our chief protector, and we all say amen. Thank you, Bishop Kennedy, Officer Dulian, and our ceremonial honor guard unit. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, I would like to introduce our honored guests and participants in today's ceremony. Please hold your applause until the last guest has been introduced. Robert O. McCullough, Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department. Good afternoon. The Honorable John A. Osewski, Jr., Baltimore County Executive. Good afternoon. Mrs. Rebecca Young, Deputy Administrative Officer for Public Safety. Good afternoon. Bishop Reginald L. Kennedy, Chaplain, Baltimore County Police Department. Rabbi Norman Lowenthal, Chaplain, Baltimore County Police Department. Terrence B. Sheridan, Retired Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department. James W. Johnson, Retired Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department. Good afternoon. Michael H. Gambrell, Retired Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department. Good afternoon. Melissa R. Hyatt, former Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department, who is unable to be here today due to a scheduling conflict. Dennis Robinson, Retired Colonel of the Baltimore County Police Department. Ms. Shirley McGuire, retired sergeant of the Baltimore County Police Department. Ms. Marty Franklin Moten, retired officer of the Baltimore County Police Department. Colonel Dennis J. Delp, chief of the Professional Standards Bureau. Colonel Joseph D. Conger, chief of the Administrative and Technical Services Bureau. Colonel John J. McGann, chief of the Criminal Investigations Bureau. Colonel Christopher M. Kelly, chief of the Operations Bureau. Sheriff Richard Height, Baltimore County Sheriff's Office. James Benjamin, Baltimore County Attorney. Yes, the Honorable Izzy Patoka, Council Chairman, Baltimore County Council, District 2. Yes, everyone. Sergeant David Rose and Lieutenant Michael DeCara representing the uh, Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 4. Yes, Officer Shelley Knox, President of the Blue Guardians. Retired Detective Rick Saylor, President of the Association of Baltimore County Retired Police. Retired Major Joseph Zerhusen, representing the Baltimore County Police Assistance and Relief Fund. Mrs. Grace Ann Rabin, President of the Executive Council of the Police Community Relations Council. I'd like to recognize the members of the Association of Baltimore County Women's Police. And lastly, I'd like to recognize the members of the Baltimore County Police Foundation. Please join me in welcoming our honored guests. Today marks a significant milestone in the history of the Baltimore County Police Department. As we reflect on the achievements of this esteemed agency, we acknowledge a legacy of courageous men and women whose commitment to upholding our core values of integrity, fairness, and service shaped our department into the formidable force it is today. We salute our fellow officers who stand alongside us today, whose dedication to duty exemplifies the highest standards of professionalism. Moreover, we pay tribute to the brave men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty, their valor, and selflessness serve as a poignant reminder of the dangers faced by our law enforcement officers every single day. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor the memory of our 10 fallen heroes. Thank you. At this time, I will turn the program over to the Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department, Robert O. McCullough. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's a little warm, right? It's a little warm, a little hot. <laughs> 
I would like to welcome all of our distinguished guests, family members, and friends. I would also like to say to our many retirees represented here today, welcome home. Because this is your home and will always be your home forever. Whether active or retired, or even a combination of these these days, we all have given most of our lives to this profession. Never, for, never forget, the people who worked here throughout the history of this department make up the department, nothing else. Today, as we stand on the shoulders of all those who came before us, we celebrate a remarkable milestone in the history of the Baltimore County Police Department, 150 years. 150 years of policing, just think about that. During the past century and a half, this department and its members have adapted, evolved, and met the ever-changing needs of the communities we serve. Each generation committed to the next in building a foundation to advance the profession and provide the necessary support for those who walked in their footsteps. Over the past 150 years, and in the evolution of policing in Baltimore County, one constant has remained, and that is the commitment, courage, and compassion displayed by our members who have proudly served. This dedication dates back to April the 11th, 1874, when our first officers earned $2 a day, $3 if they owned their own horse. In 1916, 42 years later, the department rode into the new era of law enforcement when it purchased and put into service its first automobile and motorcycle. That new method of mobility and policing paved the way for enhanced communications. In 1942, officers began to utilize a two-way radio system, but continued to use call boxes into the early 1970s. There's many people in this room that use call boxes. If you use a call box, raise your hand. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> in the 1970s, the department formed some key specialized units that are still around today, including the tactical team, the hostage negotiations team, and the marine unit. In 1982, Citizen-oriented police enforcement began. We called it COPE. It was formed and would become the present day community outreach teams that we know today. And in 1990, the department's first helicopter took to the sky. Today, some 34 years later, we have a drone program, in-car computers that can be linked to school security cameras, and officers equipped with body-worn cameras. And just as technology our members utilize has changed, so have the expectations of society and our style of policing. Each era and each generation have, have been presented with unique obstacles and challenges that the members of this great department have proudly faced and successfully overcome with resilience and professionalism. Today, we pay tribute to each officer who has worn this badge and honor the memory of each of our fallen heroes who have made the ultimate sacrifice while serving and protecting Baltimore County. To their families, we express our deepest, our deepest gratitude. As we reflect on our past, let us also look forward to the future and consider these words written by the English poet, William Wordsworth. Life is divided into three terms, that which was, that which is, and that which will be. Let us learn from the past to profit the present and from the present to live better in the future. On this historic day, let us continue to support each other as we embark on the next great chapter of our department's historic journey. And let us be guided by our core values of integrity, fairness, and service. In the book of Matthew, 
the fifth chapter, ninth verse, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Before I conclude, I would like to personally thank Major Paul Borowski and Detective Phil Krombecker for all the hard work that those two have done. Without them, this event today would not have happened. I also want to thank Ms. Elena DeLucia and Ms. Kathy Wallace for everything that they've done to also make this day a success. Lastly, I would like to say that as someone who began my career as a cadet with my dear friend, Phil Crumbacker, some almost on May 2nd will be 39 years ago. I'm truly humbled and honored to serve as your police chief. Thank you, and let us celebrate this momentous occasion together as one big family. May God continue to protect you. May God continue to bless the noble work that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Chief McCullough. I will now turn the program over to the Baltimore County Executive, John A. Osefsky, Jr. We'll try this the first time. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, thanks to our, our amazing chief for warming us up there. Uh, congratulations on 150 years of vigilant, steadfast, and courageous work. Thank you to Chief Robert McCullough for your continued leadership and tireless dedication to our officers and the communities we serve. We also thank and welcome back Chief Sheridan, Johnson, and Gamble. Thank you all for your service as well. Thanks to our Executive Corps members, the retired Executive Corps, and all former and current members of this historic department. Special thanks to you, Major Mike Cortez, for your exceptional work and your service as this afternoon's MC. 150 years, it is an incredible milestone for this department. A century and a half of brave service, generation after generation of officers and professional staff who are proud to wear the badge, put on the uniform, and keep our community safe. As a former history teacher, I know how important it is to look back on the past so that we can learn about where we started celebrate how we've changed, and envision together where we're going. When this department started back in 1874, public safety looked a little different in Baltimore County. And we've had five different police chiefs who managed each district separately. Over time, they were consolidated under our first marshal of police, Charles O. Kemp, and Baltimore County began to update and strengthen our hiring practices to ensure that the officers of this department were prepared to keep our residents safe. This included three women who became the first females to join the department as matrons and special officers in 1913. In 1952, the Baltimore County Police Department welcomed the first three black officers into their ranks as well. This department has continued to evolve and change, welcoming new heroes in your ranks and culminating in Baltimore County Police Department becoming the first major department in the country to be awarded national accreditation back in 1984. Another huge milestone 110 years after you began. Since then, you've continued to use data-driven solutions, new technology, and stronger community relations to ensure that our residents are safe and feel safe. You haven't stopped making history either. Five years ago, this department swore in the first female police chief in our county's history. And last year, we welcomed our first black police chief as well. Thank you to former Chief Hyatt and current Chief McCullough for your trailblazing leadership and for your commitment to Baltimore County. We are stronger because of you. And Chief, today, your leadership continues to inspire the men and women of this department to continue making history and to stay dedicated even in the most difficult of moments. I know this dedication 
comes at a cost. We see it in honoring those officers who we lost in service. I see it up close with a brother of mine who has the honor and privilege of serving alongside you today. I see it when we visit places like shock trauma, when we have officers injured in the line of duty. We're grateful, not just for your willingness to make these sacrifices, but because of the ways in which you take these dangerous situations and turn them into opportunities to engage with our residents, to learn more about the communities you serve, to transform into a model of respectful, responsive, and effective service. Earlier, earlier today, we presented our fiscal year 25 budget, and when we were crafting this document, we did take a look back at some of the greatest accomplishments we've achieved together. That starts with the men and women who wear the uniform every day. And we're proud that in these past six years alone, we've made historic investments in our officers to make them among the best compensated in the region. As the chief pointed out, we made a lot of progress in the days when you were paid $2 a day for service or $3 when you had your own horse, chief. <laughs> we're gonna continue to make those critical investments not just in our people, but in our infrastructure including the $22.5 million to finish the brand new Wilkins Police Precinct, as well as millions of upgrades for our support operations, pistol ranges, and forensics departments. Additionally, we're requesting more than $25 million to build a new Essex Precinct with the Fiscal 26 referendum. All of these investments come on top of a historic achievement list, like the Bipartisan Smart Policing Act, historic reforms that have increased transparency in our departments, the expansion of the Internal Affairs Division, and the investment in body-worn cameras. Together, we have made it clear that we can hold officers to a high standard while also ensuring we give them all the support and funding they need to meet them. As you all have consistently shown, you have exceeded expectations and made Baltimore County a safer place to live, work, and raise a family. We're so proud to celebrate 150 years of excellent service with all of you and we're thrilled to be your partner for years to come. Looking forward to celebrating another 150 years and more of exceptional service. God bless, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Oskowski. I will now turn the program over to retired chief of the Baltimore County Police Department, Terrence B. Sheridan. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Major. Um, as good Chief McCullough said, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, uh, to be among so many people that have dedicated their lives and the people that support law enforcement day in and day out. Uh, going back in the history, 150 years, my wife and I, family and friends, often we go into Baltimore to a small restaurant that we enjoyed. And I used to laugh thinking it 150 years ago it was in Baltimore County. And uh, that's uh, the Baltimore City got much larger, and I wasn't on the job yet, Chris. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, what makes this organization so exceptional is the recruiting, the hiring, training, and placement of people that make a difference day in and day out. If you didn't have such exceptional people, I don't believe this organization would be as successful as it is. Having been around law enforcement a long time, this is one of the best organizations there is. Very effective, very efficient, do a great job, tenacious and competent. And they do it day in and day out. And for 150 years, they've set a high standard. Baltimore County is recognized internationally as an exceptional law enforcement organization. And it's because of the exceptional people that work here. The exceptional support we get from our citizens, that doesn't come by accident, it comes by working hard. But it's the people that make a difference. Every job is important. If a job fails, then we have an issue or a problem. Everyone has to work together and that's what's so great about this organization. And as I look at it today with people that are looking at law enforcement as evil, it, it is not. You need good law enforcement to keep people safe and secure in their lives and how they go about their daily business. If good law enforcement's not there, then we've failed. This is a good organization. It gets better every day. Technology is important, but again, it gets back to the people that make a difference. 
congratulations on 150 years, and it's great to see some old friends I haven't seen in a while. And a little bit of bantering always goes a long way, and uh, I love the personalities of these people. They get uh, joking about things, we laugh about things. Gallows humor, and when you're dealing with such an important government process, oftentimes you have to break from that stoic environment and start laughing at yourself and laughing about what's going on because this is serious business. It's life and death stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, retired Chief Sheridan. I will now turn the program over to retired Colonel of the Baltimore County Police Department, Dennis Robinson. I apologize first because my talk is about 15 minutes long. <laughs> and it is. And it had to be actually 14 minutes and 47 seconds when my wife timed because I wanted to keep it under the 15. But um, when Phil asked me to talk about history, I can't imagine any way to talk about it in less than hours, actually. But anyway, good afternoon. For a celebration like this, age is certainly a relative concept. As I ponder why Phil asked me to do, give this talk, I scan the crowd and see that I'm older than most of you in the back rows. <clears throat> I'm also fully aware that I started my career well before most of you were born. <clears throat> While I feel pretty good, I'll paraphrase an often said, heard sentiment, I should say. My brain feels like I'm in my 30s. My body often disagrees. My last point relative to age is I was present at the 100th anniversary celebration. The 100th anniversary of the department 50 years ago, so to be here for the 150th is quite an honor. At the 100th celebration banquet, I was a few months out of the academy, I think it was about four months. I, along with another officer, were assigned as the doorman to sit there, and they said, look pretty, so we did. <laughs> we did our best, anyway. We were rewarded with the dinner and a commemorative plate that we still have hanging up with all my police stuff. Chief McCullough, for the banquet coming up later this year, I know of two outstanding replacements for the position I held back at that time 50 years ago. You might guess who I'm gonna say. Sergeant Joe Robinson and Sergeant Chris Robinson. They certainly have the genes for it and they will not disappoint you. And I will make sure they're on time. Now for the purpose of what Phil asked me to talk about today, a little historic perspective. I'm somewhat of a history buff and I'll, I'll be repeating a little bit of what you heard. I appreciate history in that it shows us how we got to where we are today. It helps us prevent mistakes and it also helps to appreciate how far we have come. While in the cadet class, we occasionally had to use high-tech manual typewriters. I started that cadet class in 1971. Fortunately, with that high-tech manual typewriter, a fellow cadet, now retired Captain Roger Sheets, taught me how to use the typewriter. He went a step further and taught me how to, use, how to change the ribbon in a typewriter. <laughs> My first assignment was in Central Records as a cadet with Cadet Tom Vargas, who many of you may know, and later I was assigned to, as a cadet to the Chief's office. I was often called the Chief's driver. While I rarely drove him, there was an occasion that I vividly recall a conversation with Chief Enzer. He told me that his dream was to have the starting salary of a police officer at $10,000. <coughs> I was stunned. I was making a little more than 5000 at the time. I was astonished that such a salary might be possible someday. I must have slowed the car down a little bit because the chief, in a very exaggerated way, told me to push on the gas pedal and get moving. Mentioning the chief's office reminds me of another high-tech item we had at the time. It was the departmental roster in his office at the old Kenilworth headquarters. A label maker was used to identify every section and division of the department. I see Colonel Rogers shaking his head, he's seen that, and I wish I had a photograph of it. 
the label was affixed to a magnet and placed on the metal wall. They were color-coded to identify vacancies, rank, as well as every section and division in the police department. At a glance, you saw the entire department. As a cadet, that was part of my job. This wall reminds me of another story. The wall also served as a disciplinary tool. A cadet was driving a little loudly in front of headquarters on Kenilworth one day while he was getting off work, leaving Central Records. It was witnessed by Sergeant Donald Shriver, who some very old timers would remember. And the next day, the cadet was called to the chief's office. He was a little nervous until he walked into the chief's conference room, and then he became terrified when he saw Chief Enzer remove his name from the board, motioning as if to toss it in the trash can. After, of course, making this point, he allowed the cadet to place his name back on the board and resume his career. That career finished at the rank of captain many years ago, many years later. So as not to embarrass the captain, I'll just say his initials were R is in Roger, S is in Sheets. <laughs> And he, he did give me permission to do that, and he also asked me to convey his best wishes to the department. My academy class was the 46. We graduated in January of 1974. It included the first female officer hired to work patrol. It was Officer Joyce Cheney. Prior to that, females were hired only to get, be given investigative roles, not for patrol work. Indeed, times have changed, so bear with me as I go through a list of the department equipment technology we had at the time of the 100th anniversary, so you might appreciate it 50 years later. Let me preface my comments by saying that I had a career I would not trade for any other. I'll be talking about changes the department had in equipment back in the day. It would be wrong to interpret it as complaining, far from it. My philosophy in doing the job was not to focus on what latest gadgets or technology we might come up with, but in doing the job with what we had. And at that time, we had no concept of what could be coming 50 years later. Progress is and has proven to be inevitable, but the reality is that it does not happen immediately. So let's talk about 50 years ago. The patrol uniform we wore was what the Honor Guard is wearing today. It's exactly what we wore on patrol. Sam Brown belt and all. It's not practical to wear that nowadays with the equipment that police officers have to carry, but I will say appearance does make a difference. We wore white long sleeve shirts year round and ties year round. Communications did not exist in terms of the 911 center. We had a headquarters dispatch center in the old Kenilworth building in the corner of the building. When a call was received, basic information was taken and put on a card by the person answering the telephone. The person would take that car, card, go to a carousel of books over the size of a telephone book, look up the address and identify the police car number that handled that area. That person would then put that card on a moving track. The track would go down the course to one of three dispatchers, East Patrol, West Patrol, and Central Patrol. I heard a story once where somebody sent the card down and took a match to it to kind of wake somebody up. But I don't even know the names of those people, so no risk of embarrassing those folks. An actual early dispatch console is on display at the, at the uh, museum. I hope you get a chance to look, look at it. We went from pagers with a beep signal that notified you to call dispatch to find out what the message was. Then the great advancements was a pager with texting capability on it. I was issued my first cell phone as a major. It was a shoebox type phone, big thing, really. Confiscated from a drug dealer. We had ink prints versus digital. You had to take the glass, roll the ink on this pad of gla uh, glass, roll each individual print, then transfer it to a paper print, not once, but three times. County card, state card, and federal card. A lot of you still remember that. It wasn't all that far back. There was no DNA capability, no desktops, no laptops. The IBM computers were in their infancy. They were programmed with high stacks of IBM punch cards. Most of you probably don't remember that, but I remember the guy who was working back at that section carried them, literally big stacks, armfuls to go and do what he had to do with it. 
They were programmed to do crime analysis. Cars, we had no air conditioning in the cars that were still around from the mid-60s to the late 60s. No AC at all. No AM, FM radios. Lights and sirens. We had one rotating red light on the roof of the car. That was it. Nowadays, a police car going down the road looks like a Christmas tree. Everything lights up in every direction imaginable, so much so that you really can't tell sometimes which direction it's coming and going. Lights everywhere. The car numbers were different. We had a series of 100, 200, and 300 to correspond with Western Patrol, Central Patrol, and Eastern Patrol. The siren was activated by pushing on a horn after changing a switch. The siren had only one tone. Sirens nowadays, you can sound like an orchestra going down the road with what they can do with those things. An upgraded version of the siren was a cone-shaped device on the roof of the police car. It was great except for when it snowed. When it snowed, the snow would become compacted in the cone and the si sound of the siren was reduced to a mere hum. And that's all you heard in the car. That worked radios. We only had one radio attached to a police car. You had no radio to carry with you. Any call you went to was without the benefit of it, and we had three channels, east, west, and central. Another channel was for a talk around group. It was pretty good, the system was fine, until we were interrupted by what we called back in that day, SKIP. SKIP was a police department in Louisiana. Their dispatch would come across our radio every bit as clear as their own dispatchers. A little while later, each precinct received one repeater radio. It was a handheld and would transmit from your handheld to your car and then to headquarters. Old timers didn't use it, so it was always available for rookies. Old timers didn't use it because they didn't want to be tethered to something to communicate with. We did not have body armor when it was issued. It was a front vest only. Our weapon was a six-shot revolver with 12 extra bullets conveniently located on the gun belt. Those bullets were brass, we had to polish those, and reloading was one at a time. So you had a total of 18. No helicopter, aviation was started by a police officer who leased his plane, as I understand, for a dollar a year. No marine unit, that was also started by a police officer. The first hostage negotiation team vehicle was an old AMBO. No ear protection at the range, which might explain why I frequently ask my wife, Barbara, to repeat things. <laughs> no law enforcement officer's bill of rights. We did get it in the early 70s. It's gone now, and I'll get back to that later. Academy classes were about 16 weeks, beginning with the class that started last Saturday. I understand it's 32 weeks now. We had no academy facility. We had a very small classroom. Uh, auditorium type thing that held our classes in the Kenilworth location. We had no gym, nothing else separate from it. Every police office in this building, including quartermaster, evidence, crime lab, central records, and even our own print shop would fit into that building, which was about the size of a current modern day library in Baltimore County with a basement. Our district court, for me anyway, was in the basement of a high store on Philadelphia Road. Not exaggerating. It was okay until the milk delivery came. And then you could hear the sound like the ceiling crushing in. More extraordinary, we had it. My first precinct facility was a multi-purpose type building throughout history. It was originally a liquor store. Converted to a magistrate's court and then to a police station without the benefit of a cell block. But we did have a steel support post in the middle of the open area where the desk sergeant was and that's where we handcuff prisoners to hold for processing. That's the old Fullerton station. I guess the county still owns it. I'm not sure exactly what it's used for. 50 years ago, the 19, 1974, the police budget was $18.8 .8 million. I understand this past year, current fiscal, it's about $260 million. I guess we'll find out the results of today, what it's going to be at the, uh, for the next fiscal year. Okay, <laughs> no doubt. Appreciate what you have, knowing eventually things do change. Now, these are the tangible items I mentioned. Let me talk about the intangible. I entered the police department when public sentiment did not see policing in the most favorable light. Old timers would, re would remember that. We had civil disorders, demonstrations, Vietnam War protests, and very frequent attacks on police officers. During a so-called war on drugs, when there was a drug revolution going on, the tone was anti-establishment, 
and the police were seen as the establishment. This then evolved into the campaign slogan of the early 70s, the national campaign of law and order. It's broadcast everywhere. <clears throat> Society saw the repercussions of the anti-police movement, increased crime and smaller recruitment candidate pool. Sounds familiar. History does repeat itself. This evolved into efforts to recruit police. One benefit offered by the federal government <clears throat> was a law enforcement education assistance program in which recruits would have a guaranteed payback on their college tuition if you committed to four years of service. 25% was paid for each year. It was not a lot different than what has happened in recent years with calls to defund, create more restrictions, and removing due process for officers as seen in the abolishment of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. The Law Enforcement Bill of Rights worked well but was abolished because it was construed as an excessive entitlement by those obviously not aware of the process and its application. In reality, it is little more than a set of due process procedures applied to administrative allegations of neglect and misconduct, not for criminal misconduct by police. People working in internal affairs would have known that. In Baltimore County, it was applied successfully for over 50 years. The abolishment of the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights is a detrimental change in the current police environment. It's an example of not learning from history. I hope future legislators see the error and fix it. For those currently in the profession, know that policing has adjusted to similar movements over the 150 years. So don't be discouraged by political whims or persuasions from the extremes. Focus on doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason. Take pride in what you do and service to others. I'm not going to dwell on the police environment of today, because that would probably take another 20 minutes, except to say that it is still evolving and will always evolve. Policing in a free society requires that the profession adjust to changes imposed by its society, the courts, as well as local, state, and federal legislators. While change is constant, what we consistently have are members of a profession, both sworn and non-sworn, with a commitment to service and integrity that overshadows the extreme few who fall short of that. <clears throat> Policing is often the art and science of being all things to all people. It has evolved to that because when all the social and government institutions intended to create a cohesive society fail, the burden of picking up the pieces falls on the police officer <clears throat> who gets the 911 call and walks up to the door. It seems contradictory to call police officers first responders, when in reality they show up when everything else has failed, such as the family, education, mental health care, drug policies, the criminal justice system, and yes, at times, policing itself. I, for one, am very fortunate to know many department members from the generation before me. Those who are served alongside and the generation following mine. Together we have a legacy to be very proud of. The most important legacy of our department, well beyond equipment and trends, as repeated already by Chief Sheridan, is you, each and every member of this department, past and present and future. And then there are those who gave all. Officer Ed Kuznar, Officer Charles Huckabah, Corporal Sam Snyder, Officer Robert Zimmerman, Sergeant Bruce Prothero. I didn't think this was gonna happen. <laughs> Sergeant John Stem, Sergeant Mark Perry, Lieutenant Mike Howe, Officer Jason Schneider, Officer Amy Sorrells Caprio. Her mom was here earlier and had to leave. Never forget them. To the generation before me, thank you for what you gave us. For those of my generation, thanks for being there with me. We had a great ride. For the current generation, make a difference and leave it better for those following in your footsteps. Thank you very much. Oops.
Thank you, retired Colonel Robinson. I will now turn the program over to retired sergeant of the Baltimore County Police Department, Shirley McGuire. That's a hard act to follow. He was my boss, and he was a great boss. <laughs> and I think that you will find out we're all from the same generation. And I'm going to skip over a couple of things because Colonel Robinson has said those, said them well. Chief McCullough, thank you for the invite. Phil, thank you for the invite. Major Cortez. It's a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for letting me be here. And to everybody else who I don't know and all my old retired friends that I have seen, I've known Phil a long time, and I would best describe him as one of my work children, and I had a lot of those over the years. More than likely, other than the chief and Phil, I didn't think I'd see very many people I knew here today, so I'm glad that all the retirees are here. Um, I've been gone longer than I worked here, and wherever Officer Speed is told me that's good because I'm into the county's money now. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't figured out yet, I'm old, and the next reference will confirm that. In 1964, I recall Bob Dylan releasing a song entitled The Times They Are A-Changin', and they were... I doubt Mr. Dillon, if you want to call him a mister, I don't think he was talking about the same change as we are, and I don't think that he knew how vast or fast things were going to happen. Only 10 years later, I came to work here. Change is the act of making something or someone different or improved. It pushes us forward, it's a good thing, yet sometimes it's very hard to do, and many will resist it. Communications, computers, and women are on the top 10 list of the most changed things in the last 50 years. The police department has certainly scored big in those three areas. Many of the bigger changes arrived after I retired. And Colonel Robinson went over a lot of things, but when I left, there was two computers in the station. The secretary's word perfect that everybody was hoping to type on so they didn't have to use the typewriter. To those of you who work here now, you cannot comprehend or appreciate the advances you have without, in the words of another 60s song, because that's where I'm stuck, look behind from where we came, the history. It's important because time has proven some part of the past will resurface. It is a circle game. There's a reason I think that they put me right after Colonel Robinson, not because I work for him. It's not a woodlong conspiracy, because <laughs> we had a few of those things going on over there. But April 11th is today, four more days, and it would be my exact 50-year anniversary date. April 15th, 1974, females in law enforcement were very new. That's the day the following right behind him in the 46th, the 47th recruit class started. There were females hired as patrol officers in his class. My class was the second. Prior to that, the ladies who were hired were hired as police women, and the ones I recall being around then were Detective Linda Busick in sex crimes, Corporal Mary Price in detectives, the third, who everyone later knew as Major Pat Hanges of the Juvenile Division. And I have a vague memory of a name, somebody older than me here, help me out, of Helena Todd. The 47th recruit class had 52 recruits, six females, and one was me. And to this day, I'm still proud that the number one and two ranking at graduation was two of the females. It was a very new thing then. I can distinctly remember my final interview at the old headquarters building where your jail is. It made a lasting impression. Colonel Rockenball had to be at least seven foot tall. <laughs> and he asked me, would you be afraid to learn how to shoot a gun? And, and I politely said, I, I, I didn't think it was an option. I thought I would have to. <laughs> Clearly, everyone was a little unsure of what to do with us girls then. 
but it all worked out and it, and it was accepted well. I was looking for a job involving people, a career with room to advance. It wasn't a woman's lib thing. And my motto was I was always a cop first. I just happened to be a girl. And I, I, I think I lived up to that pretty well. After spending six years working in a small office with a lot of numbers, the inviting starting salary, and they hadn't got to Chief Enzer's rate yet, was $9,600. And that was a very big raise for me. Discrimination, harassment, those terms didn't exist in 1974 like they do today. Was I teased, initiated, tested, watched more closely, you betcha, and it made me a better person. Uh, my thanks are always to my training officer and that first shift I had, they made me who I became. I have never forgotten those first days or years and Woodlawn became my home. Of course, the department had something new. They had firsts and they wanted to put everybody out in front. Officer Speed can remember it had to be 1975 because he knows when he came on. There was the promotional pictures and they're quite humorous now. If you haven't seen Officer Speed and I on the wall in the museum in front of antique cars, please make sure you see it. It's pretty funny. And we repeated that today. We got our picture taken together in front of a very new police car in the circle. Chief McCullough. I am sure today's recruiting shots with you with 20 females works a lot better than Bob and I. <laughs> Since Detective Krumbacher contacted me, we shared a lot of stories, a lot of memories. Phil, once again, used all his training knowledge and experience and expertise and his interrogation finesse and somehow conned me into rewriting my 125th yearbook article for the 150th. He won, he wore me down, He just like he's done a many suspects through the years. <laughs> I had many, many various assi assignments and I had opportunities to do things not everyone would get to do. I was able to learn many, very many aspects of law enforcement and got promoted twice. I got to do some new, different, inventive, creative, and crazy th things during a changing time. Uh, the colonel over there had a dream one time, and then it ended up into lots of pizzas and thousand hot dogs, and he, made, he got his dream come true. A great deal has changed since I started my career. Amazing changes, all moving forward, yet sometimes great change causes other areas to be neglected. Lots of modernization over the years has affected the human aspect of policing and the world too. In 1974, even though weakened some by 1998 when I retired, there was still a certain kind of respect for police and the laws. Today, so many people think the laws are for everybody else, not for them. I was raised to respect and obey police officers and if there were issues to address, to address them in a proper manner, not by defiance, disobedience, or disrespect. And if we had more time, I could tell you that in my father's words exactly. Um, I'm proud to see the things the department does today, okay? When I see all the activities you have with communities and the kids, you're working hard to change the next generation. It's one of the most important things that you can do for the public to back you and support you. Which is not to say that catching the bad guys is not always important. To every police officer here today, thank you for your service. To all the ladies who came after me, to those who took the path to run this joint, yay. <laughs> and to those who love the work at the bottom and you stay there, bless you and thank you for sticking it out and doing your part to create a lot of good change. At the current count of 370 sworn female officers, you have 299 more than the other seven I had to turn to. That's 37.7% increase since 1974, which I'm sure is not due to officer speed and eyes picture. I still remember how important the numbers game is around here. 37.7 might sound good, 
It doesn't really mean anything. It's not a true picture of anything. It doesn't account for all the female officers who have come and retired in the interim years. And this is where all of us old people get to the hard part. But most important, it does not account for our lady cop, our fallen hero, Amy Caprio, who along with the nine other fallen heroes gave their lives, who will be honored in the next few months in the month of May. And that, my friends, is the one very sad change that I come here today to talk about. There was only one fallen hero in 1974 when the colonel and I came on the job. And the next seven who were lost, I knew and I work with. May they all rest in peace and never let them be forgotten. I do not envy the job you have to do in today's world. Do your best and always do the right thing. I love my job. It was very, very good to me, to all my bosses, the people I work with, Baltimore County, thank you. And let me close with words of somebody way more famous and important than me which in my mind has a lot to do with being on this blue team. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give, Winston Churchill. Be safe, here's to your retirement. It is a lovely thing. And one more final parting shot. Colonel Rogers, to you, a special thank you for the corporal to recruit advice. I think I listened. I'm still up here running my mouth today, all these years later. He told me when I left the academy, get known, let them know who you are, girl. <laughs> Thank you, retired Sergeant McGuire. I will now turn the program over to retired officer of the Baltimore County Police Department, Marty Franklin Moten. I'm so proud of you, Chief McCullough. Good afternoon, everyone. The command staff, good afternoon to you. Baltimore County Executive Johnny Oshevsky. I have to say something about your last name. I have a problem pronouncing it as it's really spelled. So I have to spell it, the letter O, C-H-E-F like a chef, and ski like you're going skiing, okay? I can never pronounce your name. Johnny O. My sister said don't do that. Okay, first I would like the to thank the Baltimore County Police Department, especially Chief McCullough and Major Paul Borowski for inviting me to speak. In 1980, at the age of 28, I decided to enter the Baltimore County Police Department. I joined the 59th recruit class. Having two brothers in the Maryland State Police also encouraged me to pursue a career in law enforcement. My parents said you either become a cop or you become a teacher. So I come from a family of educators in law enforcement. I believed it should not have taken affirmative action for me to belong to any police department. I believed and I knew that I deserved to be here regardless of my race or ethnicity. And that's the truth. If my memory serves me correctly, I was one of four black women in the class. It was not easy because of one incident between myself and one other recruit who advised me we minorities did not belong. Well, he said that to the wrong woman. <laughs> and when I finished talking to him, we had no more problems. <laughs> that was not going to deter me from pursuing my law enforcement career. Maya Angelou said it best, when someone shows you who they are, you better believe it the first time. It was a very challenging time for me, especially the physical training because I was completely out of shape. And I had been out of high school for a while. My study habits had to come back. I needed to prove to myself and no one else that I would get through the academy to graduation. After graduation, I was assigned to Precinct 3 and worked with some great people. I was in patrol for six years. I was later assigned to the Police Athletic League, but before that I did a small stint in COPE. The motorcycle was too big for me, so I gave it up. 
I also went into community outreach, the unit, for 23 years. I became one of seven minority officers who founded the Blue Guardians. This organization was formed for minority officers due to concerns of unfair practices that some were experiencing. The organization also wanted to make sure diversity and inclusion would be looked at when it came to minorities who wanted to transfer into specialized units. During my time as an officer, I was fortunate enough to have two incredible mentors, the late Corporal Gwen Parrish and Thurkey Guy of the Counseling Unit. I'm not sure if she still works here. Okay. Prior to Precinct 4 opening, I was approached by Captain Kim Meeks Hall, who was looking for an experienced outreach officer to assist her in setting up the new precinct outreach office. I immediately accepted the position. If anybody knows John McGee and his McGeeisms, I said, this is a perfect opportunity to get away from the McGeeisms. I must say that the best time of my 29 year career was working at Precinct 4 under Captain Kim Meeks Hall and Sergeant Vicki Wareheim. They never told us what we can't do in that unit. They always said, what can we do to make this unit better? They empowered us to devise and implement projects throughout the communities serviced by our precinct. In closing, I'd like to quote Maya Angelou one more time, and she says this, we all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry, and we must, we must understand that all the threads, all the threads of this tapestry are equal in value no matter their color. So as I look at the Baltimore County Police Department today, I see it as this tapestry. This police department has come a long way. It still has a ways to go, and it must continue to improve itself by maintaining diversity and inclusion within its ranks. And I'm so honored to be here for the 150th anniversary. Mine was not as long as this man here, this third guy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, retired officer Franklin Mouton. I'd like to ask Chief McCullough and retired officers of the Baltimore County Police Department, Richard Harding and Mike Widenhouse, to please step forward. Okay. <laughs> At this time, retired officers Harding and Widenhouse will present the original first Baltimore County Police Badge from 1874 and the third badge from 1901 to Chief McCullough, which will be on loan for one year to the department for display in the museum. Thank you, Chief McCullough and retired officers Harding and Widenhouse. Before we conclude today's ceremony, it's important to shine a light on a fundamental aspect of our agency, its historical preservation. This invaluable role isn't mandated, expected, or considered a formal obligation. Instead, it's fulfilled voluntarily by unsung heroes who operate behind the scenes and without recognition. It is because of their shared knowledge, passion, and meticulous efforts 
that we understand where we began and the journey we've taken along the way. I'd like to ask Chief McCullough, retired major of the Baltimore County Police Department, Ronald Schwartz, and retired officer Bob Speed to please step forward. appreciation of service rendered to Baltimore County Police Department, your voluntary efforts driven purely by passion and dedication have significantly enriched the understanding of the past. Operate entirely behind the scenes, you have devoted decades to ensuring that our collective heritage remains vibrant and accessible to current and future generations. Your selfless work is a testament to your deep commitment to preserving our shared history. The department presents retired Major Ronald Schwartz and retired officer Robert B. Speed, Jr. Uh, a certificate of appreciation on this 11th day, day of April and the year of 2024. And uh, I had the privilege of working with both these guys and uh, no two finer guys and no, no two finer men in terms of encouraging the generation. I would like to thank all of our active and retired members and specialized units who volunteered and participated in today's successful event. To Mission Barbecue for graciously supplying our members and guests with their delicious food. Thank you, thank you to Detective Philip Crumbacker for working countless hours and also Major Paul Borowski to ensure our police museum was in impeccable condition for today's event and the future going. I'm gonna pause for a moment. We're gonna, we're gonna get these guys in. Uh, And there was others that helped, you know, but uh, these guys work tirelessly, and uh, you can see the byproduct of it on their faces and in their, in their eyes right now. So, um, we are eternally grateful. Thank you. Give me a second. I threw you off. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All good. All good. Uh, yes, so. I wrote in here because it was interesting when I uh, spoke to Phil earlier uh, this evening, uh, last night actually. Uh, this week he located a treasure trove of historical items to display within the museum, such as officers' reports dated as far back as 1925, and it, with the Baltimore County Police Department uniforms from the 1950s. <laughs> Phil just showed me everything that he found, and it was it was absolutely incredible. It was breathtaking to see it, all the the history there. Uh, also, I'll just continue with the thank you to both of them and also uh, Major Paul Borowski for he continuously, as we see every day, the emails about the 150th anniversary upcoming events, such as the 5K <laughs> and also <laughs> the gala, which is uh, being you know, really put forth so that everybody remembers that this is what it's all about this year. I would also like to thank, just like the Chief did, Ms. Elena DeLucia and Ms. Kathy Wallace from the Chief's Office for volunteering their time for this event. And just a reminder to all of everybody here and anybody else, uh, also there's going to be an after-gathering celebration at Nick's Grandstand Grill and Crab House from 3 to 7 this evening. At this time, I would like to ask Rabbi Nolan, uh, Norman Lowenthal to please step forward to give the benediction. Before we offer the blessing of benediction, I just wanted to say that as a citizen of Baltimore County, and as a chaplain with an inside view for about 10% of the department's history, um, this department is a blessing, truly. <laughs> Let us be in an attitude of prayer. With heads bowed and hearts lifted, we celebrate in reverence to the Almighty, grateful for 150 years of devoted service by the Baltimore County Police Department. As we reflect on achievements challenges, and lives touched, 
May we honor the professionalism and dedication of all those who have worn the badge and those who support them. In this moment, we give thanks for the legacy of integrity that guides each officer's footsteps, inspiring trust and confidence. Let fairness be our beacon, seeking justice with impartiality and compassion, ensuring dignity for all. As we renew our pledge of service, may we honor the selflessness of those who protect and serve. With this heavenly guidance, may integrity, fairness, and service illuminate our path, strengthening our bonds that unite us. May divine blessings of wisdom, protection, and grace accompany us on our journey forward with gratitude for the past and hope for the future. Let us move forward together, guided by faith and committed to serving with honor and respect. And let every heart say, amen. Can I get one more round of applause for all the speakers today, please? I've been fortunate enough to uh, MC the ceremonies for about eight years now when it comes to promotions, uh, Fallen Heroes Day, and also uh, the ceremonies for our awards. And this here, outside of the Fallen Heroes Day that I do every year, which is my highlight, uh, this is absolutely the second one, and this is amazing. Just to listen to the history of the department, I have 32 years on, and some of these folks I see out here in the audience, um, they're the reason why I'm here today as a major in this police department. There's no two ways about it. And uh, it's just been uh, incredible just listening to it all. Uh, it's something to take in that I never thought I'd expect. So outside of that, this has been an amazing day for everybody. I hope you all enjoy the celebration that continues today, uh, whether here or anywhere else in the building. And Nick's Fish House, yes, exactly. Nick's Grandstand Grill and Crab, please, from 3 to 7. Uh, Major Borowski was able to arrange that. He did a phenomenal job with that, so I'm looking forward to going over there and kind of decompressing a little bit and having some great conversations, some history. Uh, looking forward to that. Outside of that, please uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I know it's warm up here. Please go get a bottle of water. Um, Kathy Wallace told me there's bottles of water in the kitchen over there if you'd like to grab a bottle of water. Other than that, that's the end of our ceremony, folks, and thank you for coming. <laughs>